So, let's begin the next topic which is about transonic flight. What is transonic flight? If an aircraft was initially flying in the subsonic and then need to move to the supersonic zone, in between that it needs to cross the barrier where certain part of the aircraft would be traveling in the subsonic region and certain part of the aircraft would be traveling in the supersonic region. Why this could happen? We can take the example of the propeller driven aircraft as we discussed in the last class maybe the normal air propeller driven aircraft is traveling at a speed of uh, it could be 0 0.7 Mach but then the propeller blade tip could be reaching the speed of sound. So that part of the aircraft that means in this case the propeller tip is reaching the speed of the sound whereas the remaining part is still flying in the subsonic uh, zone. So this type of configuration is known as the transonic flight conditions. Why this point is essential to be disco uh, discussed because as certain part of the aircraft the air is behaving like a supersonic flow and in certain part of the aircraft the air is behaving like a subsonic flow so that implies that in certain part of the aircraft I need to consider the compressibility effect. I need to consider the fact that the, I no longer can ignore the effect of pressure. I need to consider the effect of density. Whereas in the other part, I can still ignore the effect of density. So one part I need to consider the effect of density and uh, pressure, whereas the other part I need to consider the effect of pressure. So if at this point of time, at this particular place, the pressure is increased, whereas the other part, I no longer, I am not required to consider the effect of pressure. So this can have an effect on this part and thereby the aerodynamic of the aircraft can change and if that happens it is difficult for the pilot to control the situation because he is not very much aware of what and how the air is behaving and that is why to fly in the transonic region is going to be difficult. So the pilot would try to move out of this transonic zone as fast as possible. Okay. So once the pilot crosses the transonic zone, we have got the supersonic flight condition. Now whenever we talk about the supersonic flight condition, that means the speed has already crossed the speed of sound. The speed of the aircraft has already crossed the speed of the sound. Because the speed of the aircraft is already beyond the speed of the sound, so now there is not much of problem <coughs> in regard to the variation of local pressure or density because we need to consider the effect of pressure and density along the entire aircraft. So we don't need to consider the fact that I am not aware of how the air is behaving here, whether I need to consider the effect of pressure or density or whether I need to consider the effect of pressure and density at this point because I am fully aware of that the entire aircraft is flying now in the supersonic zone, so I need to consider the effect of pressure and density. The local variation I need to consider, I no longer can ignore this fact. Because if certain thing is unknown, def definitely it is difficult, isn't it? So in the subsonic zone, nothing is unknown. I know that I can ignore the effect of pressure. But in the transonic zone, I am not exactly sure of what is happening. Because certain part behaving certain way and certain part behaving in some other fashion. So that it's creating the problem. Again in the sub supersonic there is no problem because I know the entire aircraft now behaving in the supersonic uh, flow characteristics way and thereby I need to consider the effect of pressure and density. Now what would lead to the accumulation of the shock wave or how the shock wave is generated? So because as we have discussed in the previous class, as the aircraft would be traveling, so the net velocity at the front of the pressure wave will be increased because the pressure wave and the velocity of the aircraft are both in the same direction. Whereas behind the net velocity will be decreased because the velocity of the aircraft and the pressure are in opposite direction. So behind the aircraft, the individual pressure wave there will be the distance between individual pressure wave will keep on increasing because the net velocity is decreasing whereas at the front the distance between individual pressure wave will keep on 
decreasing. Now, how we are generating, or not we, or rather the aircraft is generating the pressure wave. So the aircraft is generating the pressure wave because it is interacting with the air and thereby it is generating the pressure wave. It takes certain amount of time for individual pressure wave to form. Quite natural, isn't it? It will take some time. Now, we are assuming two different conditions and we are trying to compare. Let's say if the pressure wave is forming at a certain speed and the rate at which the pressure wave is traveling because this pressure wave once it is being formed it needs to move out isn't it and for that it requires some space correct so i have got some pressure wave being formed and the other pressure wave which was already formed is also trying to move away so there is a propagation of this pressure wave now if the rate at which the pressure wave is being formed is more than the rate at which the pressure wave can move away from each other in that case all this individual pressure wave will keep on accumulating right so they will keep on accumulating so once they keep on accumulating so i've got one pressure wave here the second pressure wave here third pressure wave here fourth pressure wave here so the entire pressure wave keeps on accumulating so if individual pressure wave keeps on accumulating, so that would give rise to a region of very high density pressure. And because it is giving rise to a very high density pressure, so the aircraft needs to break that barrier. And for the aircraft to break that barrier, it requires considerable amount of force. And that the force that you can hear, we call that as the sonic one. Now, the <clears throat> as we have discussed that the aircraft might not be traveling in the supersonic zone initially certain part of the aircraft could be traveling in the subsonic zone and certain part of the aircraft could be traveling in the supersonic zone the entire aircraft won't be reaching the supersonic speed at the same time now consider the wing as an example and wing is sorry a wing a wing is normally designed in such a way that the pressure below the wing should always be higher than pressure on top of the wing right that means the velocity of the air because as per bernoulli's law we know velocity and pressure are inversely proportional so if pressure below the wing is higher that implies that the velocity will be lower so velocity below the wing is lower and velocity on top of the wing is higher correct so that implies since the velocity on top of the wing is high so the air which is moving over the uh, wing will have more velocity and if this wing, uh, air is having higher velocity so that implies that the formation of the shock wave will be higher so in case of a wing if i consider the shock wave is most likely to form initially on the upper surface and then on the lower surface okay now this is the case if we are considering lift now consider a situation where the angle of attack is zero degree and the wing is symmetric if the angle of attack is zero degree and if it is a symmetric wing or zero camber wing that implies at zero degree angle of attack there is no lift isn't it so if that is the case that means there is no difference in pressure and if there is no difference in pressure implies there is no difference in velocity and if there is no difference in velocity that means the shock wave it can most likely to form equally on both the upper and lower surface so the condition that the shock wave will initially form on the upper surface and then on the lower surface is applicable only if what are the possibilities the possibility only the core possibility is if there is any lift and when can there be any lift there are two possible cases if the angle of attack is positive 
in case of zero uh, symmetric arrow foil and in case of asymmetric arrow foil even with a zero degree angle of attack also lift is possible so the difference in pressure implies difference in velocity and difference in velocity implies that the upper surface will more likely to have the shock wave <coughs> from initially compared to the lower surface and this preference is only possible or only applicable if the aircraft is having a lift, positive lift. If the aircraft is not having positive lift, in that case, this won't be the case. Are you getting me? Now consider another scenario where you got a thicker wing and a thin wing. Okay, before that, one more thing. We'll look into the concept of critical Mach number, M critical. So assume that the aircraft is flying at a speed of 0 0.7 Mach, and while the aircraft was flying or is flying at 0 0.7 Mach, certain part of the aircraft it already reached the speed of sound. Like again, we'll take the example of the propeller. So the tip of the propeller reached the speed of the sound. So that particular speed of the aircraft at which if there is a marked change in the local velocity of the air at any part of the aircraft where it reaches up to Mach 1, so that speed of the aircraft we call as the critical Mach number. That Mach number is the critical Mach number. Okay. So if I got an aircraft which is moving at 0 0.7 Mach and at 0 0.7 Mach the tip of the propeller blade attained the speed of 1 Mach. So now 0 0.7 Mach in this case is the critical Mach number. Okay. In certain other aircraft let us say one part of the aircraft attains speed of sound whenever the aircraft was flying at or is flying at 0 0.8 Mach. That is the only time when you can actually see that certain part of the aircraft has reached this supersonic speed. So now in this particular case 0 0.8 is the Mach critical number. So Mach critical number is that particular Mach speed or Mach number not Mach speed sorry Mach number at which you can see the first marked increase in this local velocity of the uh, air in such a way that that particular speed attains the value of Mach 1 and that is the critical Mach number. Okay? Now we consider a case where one of the wing is thick and the other wing is thin. Now, if you are asked the question that which wing is most likely to get the critical Mach number initially, where the change in the velocity will be high, where the velocity would increase more if I consider a thick wing and a thin wing. Are you getting my question? So, I have got two wings, one thin wing and another thick wing the air moving over the thin wing and the air moving over the thick wing. So the question is where the velocity would increase more in case of thin wing or thick wing? In case of thick wing. Why is it so? Because since now we try to logically reason out what would be the possible reason. Now if I am, if the answer lies that uh, it will be in the uh, thicker wing because the change in the velocity will be higher in thicker wing. So why does it make sense? So if you are referring to change in velocity and since velocity represents the magnitude as well as the direction. So quite possible that the change in the direction or else, or else the change in the magnitude could be high compared to a thin wing, isn't it? Now if you just think of a thicker wing and a thin wing and 
reason out or imagine that the air is moving over it. Now, if it is a thicker wing, the air needs to travel a greater curvature, isn't it? Compared to a thin wing. So, if the air is required to travel a greater curvature compared to a thin wing, that means the change in the direction is more in a thicker wing compared to a thin wing. Isn't it? The change in the direction is more because in the for the thin wing the this could be a little bit like this much could be the arc length the change whereas in case of a thicker wing at this particular point of time this could be the arc length it is changing so the rate of change in case of a thicker wing is more than in case of a thin wing so since the velocity is changing more in case of a thicker wing compared to the thinner wing so that means the thicker wing will reach higher speed or the not speed, I mean to say the, the velocity faster. So if it reaches the velocity faster, that means that thicker wing is most likely to reach or an, if an aircraft is uh, traveling and we have got this aircraft, two aircraft, one fitted with a thicker wing and another fitted with a thinner wing. So the aircraft fitted with a th thicker wing, it would reach the critical Mach number faster isn't it so a thicker wing so the bottom line is a thicker wing would reach the critical Mach number faster so we don't want the critical Mach number to be reached so fast isn't it so you won't be using the thicker wing it is not a very uh, like possible solution to the supersonic uh, flight condition At the same time, it would also give rise to increased drag because if it is thicker wing, that means more of the surface is exposed to the airflow. So, what type of the aerofoil we'll be using for high speed condition? So, we'll be using type of aerofoil which we call as the <laughs> subcritical aerofoil it is given in your book isn't it see the diagram can you see the diagram if you could see the diagram We have got this pressure wave which will keep on propagating. Now, if I try to look at it from a three dimension point of view, so we can have the first wave and then the second wave and the third wave, fourth wave, isn't it? And we can draw a tangent <coughs> along the entire periphery and then make a cone out of it, right? Now for the aircraft which is designed to fly in the supersonic speed, the aircraft needs to move into this cone. Now for the aircraft to move into this cone, the best possible way for the aircraft to move into this cone is if the aircraft, you know, the overall structure of the aircraft is also no, matching with this conical configuration. So that implies that if an aircraft is fitted with a delta wing or swept back wing, that would be the best possible design. Isn't it? And more so with a delta wing compared to the swept back wing. So that is why in high speed aircraft, if I try to figure out the reason from the MacCon point of view, the reason is why an aircraft, if someone asks you why an aircraft uh, or supersonic aircraft is having either a swept back or a delta wing configuration from the Mach point, point, uh, Mach point point of view, the answer lies because the shape of the cone and the shape of the aircraft need to be synchronized. And then only it can 
move inside and break through this barrier. Now this Mach cone angle could vary quite naturally if the speed of the aircraft vary because individual waves we are getting because of the distance speed of the aircraft. So if the speed of the aircraft changes, in that case the Mach cone angle would also change. Right? Yes or no? How it is going to change? We'll we won't be looking into this part because it is not part of your syllabus. But I will put up a video in YouTube how it is changing if you want to look into that. So Mach number, as we know, is the ratio between the speed of sound and the local velocity. If it is subsonic, it ranges up to 0 0.7, transonic from 0 0.7 to 1.2, supersonic from 1.2 to 5, and hypersonic more than 5. We have discussed the critical Mach number and you can see here yeah, this is the supercritical wing I was referring to. Then we have got something called the adverse transonic effect. Now what exactly is adverse transonic effect? <coughs> we'll be using some logic to understand what could be the adverse transonic effect. So, we are assuming a situation that the aircraft is moving in the transonic zone. And since the aircraft is traveling in the transonic zones, that implies certain part of the aircraft, we need to consider the pressure variation, local pressure variation, and certain part of the aircraft we can ignore. Or in other words, we can say certain part of the aircraft is behaving like a supersonic flow speed, and certain part of the aircraft, uh, the air is behaving like a subsonic. So there is a difference in velocity, isn't it? There is a local variation in velocity, yes or no? Yes. So if there is a local variation in velocity, that implies there is a local variation in pressure. So if there is local variation in pressure, one part I need to consider the effect of pressure and the other part I can ignore the effect of pressure. So that part of the aircraft where I need to consider the effect of pressure. So we know anything move from a high pressure region to a low pressure region. So I assume this is the aircraft and here I got this formation of the shock wave and it has got some considerable effect of the, on the pressure. So and the pressure is changing. And whereas here the pressure is normal, I can ignore the effect of pressure. So because here at this point I need to consider the effect of pressure since I have got the shock wave here and we know everything move from a region of high pressure to a low pressure that means there could be a local movement of air from this region to this region right so what it is moving it is the air that is moving yes or no now if the air is moving to balance up this difference in pressure and we know the air has got mass and it is moving that means it has got velocity as well so in other words we can say it has got momentum since it has got momentum, so this air will come and strike this surface, the other surface. Yes or no? It is equivalent to my hand no, repeatedly applying pressure. So if that happens, so naturally there will be buffeting. Right? So it would lead to buffeting of the aircraft. Now, if there is a buffeting of the aircraft structure, that means the structure could fail. And why the entire thing is happening? It is due to the fact that we have got the shock wave. And because I have got some local shock wave here, so the air would come. And because I have got a shock wave, so it is offering resistance to the incoming air. That means it will experience drag. Yes or no? 
so that drag would get increased. And the lift would decrease. <coughs> because you have got a shock wave here, so the air cannot move beyond the shock wave because it is finding it difficult because this shock wave is offering resistance to the incoming air. So there is a change in the velocity and probably the velocity of air has decreased. Because as we know the lift is depending on velocity, since the velocity of air has decreased, that means the lift would decrease as well. So there is an increase in, an increase in uh, track and a decrease in lift. And because there is a decrease in lift, that means the aircraft will move nose down. And if the aircraft goes nose down, that implies there is a change in the central pressure. In other words, we can say that the central pressure has moved. So what could be the possible effect of uh, transonic uh, flight condition or adverse transonic effect? If you are asked to summarize the tra adverse transonic effect, you can say, well, if an aircraft is moving in the transonic zone, it will lead to voice or lead. Okay. So if there is a shockwave formation, so I will have very local variation in pressure and because of this local variation in pressure there will be local flow and that local flow would give rise to buffeting of the aircraft structure and the structure might fail. One first thing. Second thing is because of the formation of the shockwave, it will offer resistance to the incoming air so it will give rise to drag. Third condition is because it is offering resistance to the incoming air, so the air cannot move smoothly over it and it would give rise to a decrease in velocity and decrease in velocity implies decrease in lift. And if the lift is getting decreased, that means it will go nose down and if it is going nose down, that means the center of pressure has changed its position. Apart from this, what else could be the reason or what, sorry, uh, could be the effect? So you have got the shockwave being formed here. Because of the formation of the shockwave, the air, the shockwave could be so severe that the air cannot move beyond it. There is a possibility. Okay? So if the air cannot move beyond it, so that means this shockwave is a region of adverse pressure gradient. Pressure is increasing with respect to distance. Right? So the air cannot move beyond this shockwave. Because this is a region of adverse pressure gradient, pressure is increasing, so it cannot cross this barrier because it has got very high pressure. So it will come to a halt, slow down, come to a halt, and then reverse the direction. And if that happens, it will give rise to stalling. Okay? Are you getting or not? So if you, if someone asks you, what is the difference between this stalling and a normal stalling? A normal stalling happens because if you try to recall what you have studied in your basic aerodynamics, stalling is the maximum angle of attack or the minimum speed, isn't it? Yes. At which the aircraft can fly straight and level. So in case of a normal stalling, it happens due to high angle of attack or the minimum speed, lowest possible speed. But in this case, stalling happens because there is a formation of shock wave and the air cannot move beyond it. So how or why the shock wave is being formed? Because the velocity of the air was very high, more than the speed of uh, sound, and that led to the formation of the shock wave. So this stalling is occurring due to the formation of the shock wave. And this type of stalling we call as shock stall. Because it is happening due to high speed, so it is a high speed stall, unlike a normal stall, which is a low speed stall. A normal stalling means it is the lowest speed at which the aircraft can fly straight and level. But in this case, the stalling is happening due to the fact that the aircraft speed has increased to a considerable amount, which is leading to the formation of the local shock wave. And it is preventing the air <coughs> from moving beyond it and thereby the air coming to a halt and finally reversing its direction and that uh, is resulting in the formation of the stall. So this is a high speed stall condition and this type of stall, it, we got a specific name for it, we call it shock stall. Okay? Any doubt so far? Okay. 
So compressibility buffeting, I already discussed to you. Buffeting, high pressure air will come and strike. Buffeting, shockwave I discussed. The critical Mach number I discussed. Now a basic idea regarding the different types of shock wave that have been formed. This is just a very basic and general idea, not in detail. So again, if you want to know in detail, I will be doing a video on this, so you can check out that video. Your syllabus does not cover the entire detail, just the very basic <coughs> idea regarding the shock wave formation. So the initial shock wave that is being formed, because as I told you, the aircraft is flying, and then there is an increase in lift, and then we are also assuming a situation, because there is an increase in lift, that implies there is a difference in pressure. Difference in pressure implies difference in velocity, and naturally the velocity at the top, or upper surface is, is lower, than, sorry, is higher than the velocity at the lower surface. So the shock wave will be forming initially on the upper surface. And then the, the velocity will still uh, you know, keep on increasing at the lower surface. Finally, the lower surface also will reach the uh, supersonic speed and there will be the shock wave on the lower surface as well. So this shock wave, which are initially formed first at the upper surface, and then at the lower surface, this type of shock wave, we got a specific name for it, we call that as incipient shock wave. Okay? Now, this incipient shock wave is somewhat curved in nature. <coughs> but, because of the interaction of the incoming air with this wave, this wave will experience some force and because of the force it experiences, it try to get stretched up and in the process of getting stretched up it no longer remain curved but in fact it gets normal with respect to the surface where we are getting this shock wave so we call this as the normal shock wave so initially we got the incipient shock wave then we have got the normal shock wave. And then because of this incoming air, which is applying some force against the shock wave, so the natural tendency for the shock wave would be to move rearward. So it starts moving rearward. Till the time it reaches the trailing edge tip. But now the trailing edge tip has got minimum area. And nothing can stay away if the area is minimum, isn't it? Yes or no? I can put my hand here, my hand can stay here because I have got some area, but I cannot put my hand here, it will fall down, correct? So we require some area. So that is the reason why when the shock wave reaches the trailing edge tip, and since the trailing edge tip has got no area, so it cannot stay there and it moves out. The moment it moves out, the forces get decreased. Why? Because initially, if it is sticking to the surface, so quite natural there is a force between the shock wave and the aircraft surface, isn't it? But the moment it moves out, so there is no more forces between the shock wave and the surface. So that implies this velocity will be somewhat increased now, and because of which increased velocity, because of this increased velocity, it will come forward and stick at the leading edge. Having a shape of a bow. So we call that as the bow shock wave. So if these are the three stages, initially I have got the incipient shock wave, then the normal shock wave, this normal shock wave will be traveling towards the trailing edge tip, will get detached and finally move to the front, which we call as the bow shock wave. Any doubt?
So you can see in this diagram, the shock wave moving out towards the trailing edge, the normal shock wave, and then you've got the bow shock wave. Now, we've got two graphs here. As you can see, one of the graph, or uh, this graph is a very specific case. As you can see, they mentioned that the angle of attack is two degree, and the variation uh, for a specific type of the aerofoil, and uh, the variation of the coefficient of lift and drag with respect to the magma. So, initially we try to look at the effect of the coefficient of drag with Mach number as you can see here the Mach number getting increased that implies that the velocity is getting increased isn't it so if the velocity is getting increased we know drag is directly proportional to the velocity so that drag is also increasing and as you can see here it keeps on increasing 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 till Mach 0 0.98 and initially the rate of increase is not very high as you can see here but then suddenly you know it keeps on it shoots up as you can see here, it is not very it, too much increasing isn't it but then suddenly it is shooting up correct the reason why it is shooting up is because of transonic effect So because of the transonic effect, there is a shock wave and it is offering resistance to the incoming air and all this growth. After that, you can see here this is uh, that maximum is reaching somewhere at 0.98 or 1 After that, the aircraft is already out of the shock wave region. So it is already out of the shock wave region, that means that shock wave is no longer. At, uh, is offering any resistance. So now with that increase after one, as you can see here, the coefficient of drag is again decreasing <laughs> because it already moved out of the shockwave region. Okay. Then the variation of coefficient of lift with Mach number. So again, you can see here, with increase in the speed, the coefficient of lift is increasing. And then there is the formation of, or the aircraft, or there is the formation of the, uh, the shock wave. And because of the formation of the shock wave, so it is offering resistance to the incoming air, and the incoming air velocity is getting down, lower, and because as you know the velocity is proportional to the speed so because the incoming velocity is getting lower so there is a decrease in the leg there is a sudden decrease in the leg ok after that it again try to increase because Cross one barrier, the local barrier, and then it is increasing again. Okay. After that, it is so it reaches Mach one, and after that again it is increasing, getting stepped. Any doubt so far? Do you have any doubt? Next is aerodynamic heating. Because the aircraft is flying at very high speed, so it is quite possible that there will be very high friction as well. And because of this high friction, there is a possibility of high temperature buildup, and this structure might not be able to withstand that high temperature and the structure might get damaged. So what could be the solution? One of the solution could be replace the normal aluminium with something else which can withstand the temperature. So either you can replace that with stainless steel or titanium but that would definitely increase the weight as well. 
So apart from that, what else could be the solution? So you have got no solution. Prevention is better than cure. So prevent it. How you are going to prevent it? Put some probe which can sense the temperature. At which point the temperature is going to increase to a, the maximum limit, probably at the nose cone area. So put some temperature sensor which can sense this temperature. And once the temperature, once the, the threshold temperature is reached, that means now we need to decrease the speed. So that means the temperature indicator, since it is relating to the speed, that means it somehow need to be interconnected with the airspeed indicator. And then the pilot need to decrease the speed. So decreasing the speed implies decreasing the thrust. So that means it also need to be interconnected with the engine part. Correct? And if the whole thing is part of the autopilot, that means you need to integrate the whole thing and, and uh, put that in the as part of the autopilot system. Okay? In your book, as you can see, they have given some specific value and these specific values are applicable to Concorde aircraft. So in case of a Concorde aircraft, the temperature it can withstand, maximum temperature is 127 degrees Celsius. So that is the limitation. So the, there is some sort of a probe which will you know, measure the temperature and if the temperature reaches up to 127 degrees Celsius, in that case, it will direct the pilot to reduce the aircraft speed to 1.8 Mach. Okay? Next is area room. Because we are considering the supersonic speed, and if the speed need to be increased, the drag need to be reduced, <clears throat> right? I need to minimize the drag. What would give rise to drag? More the surface exposed, more will be the drag, isn't it? More the turbulent flow, more will be the drag. So if I need to reduce this effect, I somehow need to prevent any type of turbulent flow and like you know big surface getting exposed to the airflow we need to prevent that as well. So the area rule implies that there should not be any sudden increase or decrease in the area of cross section because if, this, if there is sudden increase or decrease in the area of cross section that would give rise to sharp points or sharp curvature. And if there is sharp point or sharp curvature, in that case, that area will have the turbulent flow and will have more drag. We do not want that. So, smooth out this region. Try to reduce the area. So, that's exactly what area rule is about. And that is what it is mentioned here. So, as you can see here, so alternately, the fuseless cross section would be increased with the use of endless sections behind and in front of the wing to eliminate sudden change in the cross section. We do not want sudden change in cross section. So, because if there is a sudden change, it could lead to drag. So, make it uniform. Without area rules, the greatest frontal cross section area of the fuseless would occur when the wing are attached to the fuseless. So what? possible in a maximum uh, exposed surface if the fuseless and the wing attachment point I can have the sharp curvature and there is a there will be very abrupt change in the area of cross section isn't it so we need to reduce this sort of configuration in order to reduce the drag now in case of the intake Let's say we are considering initially only the subsonic engine. 
So the main purpose of the engine is to generate thrust and maximum possible thrust, isn't it? So if the sole purpose of the engine is to generate maximum possible thrust, that can only be possible, hey, quiet. That can only be possible if we somehow can increase the pressure because more the pressure implies more will be the because if I can compress something more I can get more energy out of it yes so I need to increase the pressure to increase the pressure so what pressure I need to increase pressure of the incoming air so we are considering a situation that the aircraft is moving in the subsonic speed or it is a normal subsonic aircraft. And if I need to increase the pressure of the incoming air which is moving towards the compressor section, it is only possible if it is divergent, isn't it? Subsonic, if it is divergent, yes or no? Now what about supersonic? If it is supersonic, again my aim is similar. I need to get maximum increase in the air pressure. But now the condition is the aircraft is designed to fly in the supersonic speed. So if I need to increase the <coughs> pressure in case of a supersonic speed, quite natural I need to use the convergent duct. Isn't it? Opposite? Opposite to subsonic? Yes. So I will be using the convergent duct. <coughs> now at the point of the duct where the area of cross section is minimum, we call that point as the throat. So I have got the convergent duct, then I have got the throat. At the throat area, the velocity would be equivalent to exactly speed of sound, Mach 1. Behind that, the speed, I need to reduce it further because if I need to increase the pressure, because that is my sole objective, I further want to increase the pressure. So if I further want to increase the pressure, that means, again, it would be a regular divergent duct now. Yes or no? Yes. So what would be the type of configuration I would require? Convergent, divergent. So in case of supersonic speed engine, I require convergent divergent type duct. But the problem comes in, quite natural that the aircraft won't be traveling in or moving into the uh, supersonic speed without crossing the subsonic, isn't it? So during takeoff, the speed will be low, gradually it will increase and finally it will move to the supersonic. So that means the initial configuration is what I require during the initial phase of the flight is a subsonic configuration, a divergent duct type. If the, once the aircraft reaches the supersonic speed, I require the convergent divergent type, type configuration. If the speed is again decreasing during the landing, again I would require the divergent configuration. Because again the aircraft now is in the subsonic region. So that means I require some flexible design. I cannot have a very rigid design. I cannot have a design where it is either convergent, divergent or divergent. I require in between. I require a design which can be made variable as per our requirement. How this could be achieved? One of the possible way of achieving this is if it is a convergent, divergent duct type and in this portion, somewhere in this duct, if I got some hinge, and if this hinge can allow this to either expand or contract, and by contracting or expanding, it would change the configuration and thereby will give us the exact type of configuration, whether I require the divergent or convergent divergent type, depending on our requirement, it would change its configuration and that would solve the purpose, isn't it? So if I got a hinge here, 
that means this hinge some forces need to be acting on that hinge for the hinge to operate and what I could or what I can put it there probably some actuator isn't it now the air which is going inside the air intake the amount of air sometimes could be more than what it can withstand or hold because certain compressor is designed to, to move or the RPM is some, some constant, some maximum value of RPM. But sometimes the amount of air which is going inside could be more than the amount of air the compressor is designed to uh, hold or withstand. And if more air is going inside than whatever it is designed to withstand, in that case it could damage the compressor blade. Right? So we need to have a configuration where if there is some excessive air, we can dump this excessive air. So you require a dump bar. Now just in front of the compressor blade, we can have some turbulent flow. And if we got some turbulent flow in near to the compressor blade, so it would change the airflow characteristics and we won't require that. We don't want that. So that means I can have one more type of valve to spill out all this unwanted airflow. So we have got something called the spill valve. So you have got dumb valve and spill valve. Apart from this, there is one more type of configuration where we have got this uh, inlet and then we have got something called a bullet. We call it bullet because the shape looks like that of the bullet. Now this bullet either can slide forward or behind. And in doing so, the area between the inner wall of the engine intake and this bullet would change from convergent divergent to divergent depending on our requirement and thereby we can have a flexible option okay any doubt so that is what you are required to remember now the next topic is effect of swept back on critical Mach number. What could be the possible effect of swept back in with the critical Mach number? So we are looking at, so for this we need to consider two cases. The first case is a, an aircraft with a rectangular wing <coughs> and we are assuming this aircraft to be traveling in this direction so this is the velocity so the relative velocity of the aircraft is in this direction isn't it and this entire velocity is acting over it right And whatever the velocity is acting over it, the result of this velocity are the lift, drag, moment, whatever we are getting. Now, let's swap back me. Now, since it is a swap back wing, again, we are assuming this aircraft will be traveling in this direction, same like before with the relative air approaching and hitting the swing like this. But this velocity is not responsible for lift or drag or moment. It is the velocity which is normal to the surface that is responsible. So because only the normal component is responsible, that implies only a small portion of the velocity because certain part of the velocity is lost now. Yes or no? Yes. 
So we are taking only one part or some component of the velocity and what is the component? Then component normal to the wing that is responsible and this velocity V dash quite natural is will be lesser than the V in this case. So if this is less that implies the critical Mach number in this case will be reached at a later stage isn't it? So by using the swept back wing we are delaying the onset of the shock wave correct or the critical Mach number we are increasing because in this case let's say at 5 uh, at V equal to let just give some rough value 250 at V equal to 250 meter per second we have certain part of the aircraft is reaching the uh, speed of sound and we are getting this shock wave so for in this case this becomes a critical Mach number but in this case at 250 it is not reaching because that this velocity is less now isn't it so we are delaying the formation of the shock wave and increasing because at 250 I am not getting the shock wave local shock wave here maybe at 300 I am getting the shock wave so by having the swap back configuration I am increasing the critical Mach number ok so the purpose of having swap back wing or delta wing is by having the swap back or delta wing we can increase the critical Mach number any doubt so far Done. This will be your syllabus for your test one. Whatever from the beginning till today will be your syllabus for test one. Okay.